Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Dr. Siobhan O'Sullivan Does like knowing animals Hey you guys, welcome to Knowing Animals, the podcast. Knowing Animals is a podcast where we talk to animal study scholars about a piece of their work. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan and I do like knowing animals. Well, this episode I'm joined by a very long-standing animal studies colleague of mine. I'm really delighted to have Dr. Carol Freeman on the show. Uh, Carol has a PhD from the University of Tasmania, or UTAS, as the cool kids like to say. And she still has an association with that um, institution. She's an adjunct there. Now, Carol has written extensively on animal issues, and today we're going to discuss Carol's new book chapter. It's called The Last Image, Julia Lee's The Hunter as Film, which appears in the book Animal Death, which was edited by Jay Johnson and Fiona proben Rapsi and published by Sydney University Press in 2013. So welcome to the podcast, Carol. Thanks, Siobhan. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Carol. It's lovely to have you here. We're in sunny Annandale in beautiful Sydney town. Now, Carol, normally what I do uh, when I introduce my guests is I wait until I've done my adverts from my sponsors and then bring the guest on. But today I decided to do something a little bit different. So as regular listeners will know, there's often an ad at the start of the program. And in fact, this episode, we have three ads. But because you're very connected to two of them, I thought it'd be really nice to bring you on and we can do the ads together. So our first sponsor, who is our very long-term sponsor, is ASA. ASA is the Australasian Animal Studies Association. And the reason why ASA is so pertinent to you, Carol, and also our relationship is that we first met at an ASA conference way before it was even ASA. Which one was that? Was it the Perth one that we met at? Oh, really? I... I didn't remember that you were at the Perth one. I was at the Perth one, Carol. The very first one, yes. The very first conference. Yes, so I was going to say I've been there since its inception, but in fact, so have you. Absolutely. In fact, I've been to every ASA conference Mm -hmm. that's ever been held and perhaps you have also or you were not I think I've missed the last one. You missed the last um, one. Before that, yes, I think so. Yes. Newcastle, um... Brisbane. Brisbane, yes. Sydney. Yes, very, yes that's yeah. right. Sydney, very Melbourne. memorable. Mm. Yes. So you, Yvette Watt and I were all at the Perth yes. conference and then you and Yvette hosted the second conference in at Hobart, UTAS. Yes. yes. And then at the third conference in Newcastle, we established ASA, the Australasian mm. Animal mm. Studies mm. Association. Yes. So yes. that organisation well. has been doing very good work for animal studies scholars ever since. And um, I encourage everyone to become a member. You're a member, Carol, are you? I certainly am. Yes. And in fact, you did the newsletter for a very long time, didn't you? I did. And the bulletin, yes, uh, was a very important part of my life. And I'm I'm sure we'll have reason to discuss it later too. Yeah. It's... um, Yeah, lovely. Okay, so they're our first sponsor, our long-term sponsor, ASA, the Australasian Animal Studies Association. Now, the next sponsor is new. It's a new book that's out. It's published by Faunary Press, which is spelled F-A-U-N-A-R-Y. But I'm worried that I'm going to have trouble with the pronunciation of the title of the book. Now, it's tradition on this podcast for me to get lots of things wrong, including the names of a lot of things. So, Carol has a very extensive background in film and literature and she's going to tell us about this new book or at least introduce it. Over to you, Carol. The book's called After Kotsia, an anthology of animal fictions. Right, so it's a new book that's on sale and it's having a look at the place at... Co- See, I want to say Kuitsi. Mm, Kutsia. Kutsia. It's Dutch. It's Dutch, okay. Kutsia. <laughs> I have, I have a, a, a fleeting background um, in uh, s- s- South African. Right. Uh, yes. yes. I lived there for two years. So. Oh, okay. Lovely. That's probably the only reason I know how to pronounce it. Yes. 
Now, he has had a very big impact on Animal Studies Scholarship, hasn't he? Mm, yes, he has. And in fact, in the article that we're going to discuss, um, I, I do quote someone else quoting him or um, referring to one of his books. Yeah. Yes. So when we think about animal studies, we do often think about his work. So this will be a really interesting and worthwhile collection for anyone that's interested in animal studies and literature or film, etc. So it's after Kutsi. 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 An anthology of animal fictions. The book's on sale now. Simply go to Amazon, Google it up, or go to Funerary Press and have a look at their webpage. Now, mm. our final sponsor, who's probably someone that you've not heard about, Carol, is Kibble. K I B B L. That's K I B B L. Now, this is an app, and the app data mines adoptable pets that are on the internet, and it tries to help those pets find humans who are looking for a pet. So it's basically online dating for pets in pounds, dogs and cats in pounds and people looking to adopt. Um, Kibble also does good work in terms of helping raise money for local animal shelters. So Kibble is a great way to uh, help animals find their forever home. It's an app. You can find it at Google Play or at the App Store and you can also go to their website which is kibbl.com. Io. And details of all these sponsors are also on the notes about the podcast. Okay, enough advertising. Let's get down to business. Carol, we're talking about your book chapter. What inspired you to work on this, uh, this chapter? Well, um, I think in the process of uh, literary studies, no, I'm not sure that it was actually. I think it was when I uh, moved to Tasmania and... Uh, became interested in the thylacine that I read Julia Lee's book had just come out that was in 1999 and um, it of course I had to read it as one of the many things that I was devouring about uh, the thylacine representations of and I really I admire her style of writing or it was a troubling book but um, Yes, it was a, it, it's, a, it's a very well-written book. Then, in 2011, when the book, uh, when the film came out, of course, I was fascinated to see that. And it was very, very different in not just a book-to-film adaptation uh, difference, but uh, d- the messages it conveyed, uh, the way it represented the thylacine, um, a, ho- a whole lot of issues and of course I, c- I couldn't wait to you know sit down and uh, unpack it what why were they different mm. in what way and what what how that affected the messages that they were both putting across and the meanings and how how was that going to impact on the people who were both reading and watching the film of course the film is a very larger audience and I and I there was a conference um animal death conference in um Sydney uh, and at that time I was going to the minding animals conference in Utrecht and I asked Sally Borrell um another ASA member whether because she also had a, she had a very strong background in literature, My, mine sort of muddied by cultural studies and uh, a sort of anti-disciplinary uh, tendency, um, and so I thought, well, she could not only provide a very strong literary background so that I could um, sufficiently analyse the book as well as the film, but. Um, she could also present it at the Animal Death Conference. And, of course, it was Animal Death Conference. I mean, Perfect the whole topic. point of the, the both the film and the book was this killing of the animal. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yes, that's Wonderful. what happened. So, Carol, we have a lot of international listeners and I was hoping you'd tell us a little bit about who or what the thylacine is. Hmm. 
the thylacine uh, is 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 like a dog with a pouch. And and when I discovered, I worked for a little while. Sorry, in the, at UTAS in the Royal Society Library is, is housed there, um, and that's a really historical collection which was made right from the first days of settlement in 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 Tasmania, and. Um, uh, now I've lost my thread. You were going to tell our international listeners what the thylacine, what the thylacine is. Or who thylacine the thylacine is. Yes. Is. Um, I looked at images, illustrations in old books, and that's when I discovered that this. I didn't even know the word thylacine. Tasmanian tiger, I knew, um, which is its sort of common name at the moment. But. Um, and I discovered it had a pouch. It's a marsupial, it's a striped sort of medium-sized dog sh- uh, shape and um, and size and it's a marsupial with stripes acro- across its back. Mm. Not all the way, but across, not down. Um, and it's pretty well known. It was known in, um, in Europe. Uh, the Germans loved it, the Beutelwolf, and there's my pronunciation isn't very good, but mm. the pouch wolf. Mm. and there's lots of names that's been given over the centuries. Mm. And they lived in Tasmania? Yes, they um, lived all over Australia, existed all over Australia, but um, about three, 4,000 years ago they became extinct on the mainland and uh, were uh, the Ice Age, the, when the, the Tasmania floated away from the mainland, um, was separated from and it ex- continued to exist here because the dingo wasn't in Tasmania so uh, it had no competition that's one of the theories is that it, w- it died out on the on the mainland because of competition from the dingo which came down from Asia earlier mm. but it no longer exists in Tasmania no um, it's estimated that there were about 4,000 uh, thylacine in Tasmania in, when, you, when it was settled by Europeans in uh, early 19th century, 1809. Some of the first sightings of the thylacine by settlers were in, in 1806 and 1809, the first illustration um, by one of the people who draw maps. I can't remember what they're called. Cartographers. Cartographers, yeah, yeah. Who yeah. were? And then, what happened to them? Why are they no longer with us? Well, uh, they suffered the fate of many. Uh, I would say wolf-like, but they're not really wolf-like. They were they were seen as wolf-like animals um, in countries that Euro- Europeans settled in. Sheep were were brought in. They were considered a danger to sheep, which they weren't. Um, it, it was just a long history of um, that ended in ex- extermination mm. and bounties, mm. um, all on very little facts. There's there's a long history of fear way back to medieval times of fear of anything that is anything like a wolf um, or anything that. M- is imagined might attack a, a sheep or a cattle, or, mm. um, and it's so they were actively hunted into extinction by white settlers. Yes, there there, there are peop- there are a lot of sort of theories that would say otherwise that they would have become extinct anyway because there were so few of them, um, you know, four thousand being considered so few, um, but. All the evidence by uh, other researchers points to the fact, and Robert Paddle from Melbourne has did you know exhaustive research uh, recently. I think his book came out in about two thousand. Um, of all the all the all the evidence, yeah, all the evidence from Bushman from from politicians, from everything. Um, and, yeah, he found, he found too that there is, there is very little evidence they ever posed a threat to anybody or anything. Um, they were shy, they were rare, they, they were 
yeah, completely harmless and that of course engaged me in um, the sort of research that I wanted to do because there it seemed so such a terrible thing. Mm. So Carol what is the book about that your piece is centred on? So it's centred on a book and then a transition into a film. Can you tell us a little bit about the book? Um, the book by Julia List is called <laughs> The Hunter. Um, it's, a, it's written in a very spare, economical, cold way. Uh, and it's about someone who's sent to Tasmania by um, a company called Redleaf to find the last, in inverted commas, thylacine or close to the last thylacine and extract uh, something which is very unclear about what it is, extract something from this animal uh, for what sort of hinted at is a, bi- a biological warfare or bio-warfare um, uh, el- something that can be used for biological warfare, but also just to take whatever they can, the um, reproductive organs, blood samples and all that sort of stuff. So because it's, yeah, and that, that it's all a bit vague, but what isn't vague is that this hunter is being paid a lot of money by an international um, organisation to find, and this very secret, it's all very secret because of the bio-warfare thing, uh, connection, um, to find this animal and a lot of it's on the hunt and it's it, it's um, a sort of internal, his internal thoughts, narrative that uh, it's centred on that. It doesn't have a lot of descriptive st- stuff in it um, and of how he hunts and hides and corners and thinks about the animal in, in the in the very long hours that he does this in a, in in the wilder you know wilderness of Tasmania, of which there is quite a bit, yes, of mm. remote from um, uh, cities and I was going to say civilization, but I sort of <laughs> Sydney's not that choke far away. at that <laughs> <laughs> term. I'm not yeah. sure whether it's <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Carol, then how does the film differ? Well, I should say that the the end of the book, in the end of the book, he finally the whole book is spent um, looking at looking for the at, or finding it or trying to trap it. Um, the when he finally finds it, it it's got this sort of image of he, the the thylacine leaps at him. He shoots it three times. And then extracts the the organs, the the ovaries, the uterus, and and everything, and puts the blood sample. And it's all very technical and very cold, and then sort of virtually walks away. Um, in the film, and it's it's more or less the same. There's also a story in it in both of them, but it's developed a lot more with a love interest, of course, mm-hmm. um, in the film of a family that live. Uh, close to well, he's actually staying with them and it the the guys disappeared and uh, in the in the film he dis, uh, I'm sorry later in the story he finds that in fact he's been in, um, involved with red leaf as well um, and I think they probably killed him <laughs> um, but uh, now, now I'm sort of lost again. Um, wh- when he finally finds the thylacine after this involvement with the family, which makes it uh, him a, a lot, a lot different. He's a, he's a very different character. He listens to the Vorjak and um, hangs things in the trees, and yeah, there's a bit of a love interest. Although he's a very remote character too, um, and he does you know get involved with the the children um when he finds the thylacine there is a look that the animal doesn't leap at him which is the traditional really threatening thylacine uh image representation but turns around and looks at him and he looks back and then it turns and pads away 
and then he shoots it and then he goes to the body and he sobs and there's a whole he also gives it a, a sort of cremation and scatters the ashes over the, this magnificent empty wilderness which has got a lot of connotations but there's an implication there and Sally Borrell very much believed this that it was a mercy killing um, because he had discussed with the family, especially the, the, the girl, the woman, that, and she had said, it's better off extinct because people will just exploit it. You know, if, there is, if there's one left, it will be exploited. And that, that's still a feeling that exists in places and among people in, in Tasmania. Mm. So in both the novel and the film, it's known that if this animal exists, it is the last of the species. Or more or less the last, yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So what does that shift tell us about changing attitudes um, towards animals? What do you as an animal studies well, scholar make of that? Well, I think only an animal studies scholar would would sort of even discuss that but to me the difference between 1999 when I, I you know could there, there was there was no animal studies there, there was very little interest and um, scholars who looked at books that had that contained animals they were symbols or they were totally ignored incredibly so um, and 2011, I mean, maybe it's because I'm in the, I, I've, I was in the middle of it and watched it evolve. But although it seems to me that there has certainly been a change in, in sensitivity toward um, animal welfare in the, the, the live export protests, um, the generally in um, veganism, the, the, the rise of that... Um, I'm not quite sure whether it's because I'm I'm aware of it, but I think it's it's pretty obvious that that things are changing, and so, I certainly hope so. And so I think this reflected it very much. And one of the the interesting things about the research that I did on it was that um, you know looking at um, <laughs> hearing 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 the makers of movies say well, you've got to have a, like a happy ending. You've got to have a, um, you've got to key into what's happening at the time, now when you're releasing the film, so that audiences like it. They very much wanted to like it. And, well, you know, I guess if it had been about a family pet, you could understand, but this wasn't, so... I, th I think it's pretty obvious to me that there has been a change. Mm. There's been a change in attitudes, so and that's that's part of part of it. Mm, mm. Mm. So more compassionate. Yeah, I think so, and more awareness of extinction and um, you know global warming and um, all sorts of concern about the environment. Mm. And in the chapter, you, you go and have a look at what commentators, just kind of regular punters, had to say about the movie on, like, uh, websites like the ABC at the movie, mm. now defunct um, TV program in Australia, but a very popular TV program in its day about movies. Mm. What did those community sentiments tell you? Yeah, well, that, of course, virtually contradicts what I've just said because... <laughs> <laughs> m but... Most people talked about the cinematography, the character development. Um, they were they were focused on on the actors, on Daniel Defoe and his his part in the movie, and very much focused on that. And only a few talked about extinction or um, or the animal at all, the thylacine at all, which is seems very odd to us. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not going into their unconscious. Maybe it means that we, as animal studies scholars, should be talking more to the general population rather than each other. Um, 
uh, it's probably a certain type of person, a certain age group that posts things on those reviews on those websites. So they're looking for something different. They're looking for something different in a movie. They're looking for entertainment. They're not looking for some deep um, environmental message or some deep message about the world necessarily. They mm. just, yeah. Mm. Interesting. I thought it was, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what can the study of animals in film and literature tell us about animals' place in this world? What, 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 how do you begin the process of analysing the text? What do you look for? Well, mm, I suppose... I suppose you look... I look for how how the the writer or the filmmaker is is um at the attitudes the writer or filmmaker has toward the animal how how they respond to or use it and then i'm also but i'm also looking at the audience and imagining the audience and to me it's a two-way thing you can't just and I think it is something that literary critics get immersed in um, in the plot uh, in the you know that, that as if it's real rather than 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 seeing how this has been constructed to to do a certain thing and how then the audience are going to receive it um, and it's especially important I think where animals are concerned that's what we want to know it's about human animal relations mm. so i'm looking at how, how how what what are all the threads and the what is it doing mm, mm. what's the effect mm, interesting well carol i ask everyone who comes on knowing animals to answer five quick questions are you ready mm. for your five quick questions i am yes yes so can you recall the first piece of pro animal scholarship you ever read um yes and it, what it, i suppose because i didn't come into animal studies when it was um well along the way that it was sort of before it existed the the piece of writing that in as had an enormous influence on me was something i read when i was doing a unit called literature and environment um and we were doing north american nature writing and it was very much a sort of environmental studies um literature and it and it was a piece called not all of it had, concerned animals at all in fact very little of it uh, it was called the moose on the wall and it was written by edward hoagland who's a, a essayist american essayist um in 1974 i think or 1970 yeah about 1974 and i was just reading it the other day um again um it was it was about taxidermy and when I when I sort of read it, I realised how like Julia Lee's book it was in actual fact, except that he was describing a visit to a taxidermist shop in Vermont, where he lived, and it, it was just brilliant. I, it just devastated me. It. It was it was sort of very conversational. I don't know whether you ever listened to Letter from America. I, it, it was it was like that sort of really drew you in, and he's and he's sort of saying, well, I don't sort of really mind this stuff, but and the and the the taxidermist was a very nice guy, um, you know. We probably had the same interest in nature, except that our biases were opposing, <laughs> but opposing biases or something like that. So just a little word like that that, and 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 the language that he used too about the. Um, the implements that were used, but at the same time, in such a benign sort of way that, uh, yeah, they were just, it, it was just, yeah. Mm, interesting. And, and, and he was also talking, of course, about how the moose in Vermont had, in 1965, apparently there were something like a dozen left 
or very few. Na- the, then it went up to 4,000, I think, just recently, but it's dwindling again. Um, but he was looking at the disappearance of the moose in, um, in, in the area where he lived. Mm-hmm. So. Interesting. So, Carol, can you recall the first piece of pro-animal scholarship you ever wrote? Yes, and that, that again, that was actually in third year. That was when I, um, I went, I did that literature and environment in, in, at UTAS and then I went to Queensland for about eight months um, and I went to UQ uh, and did 18th century literature with the great John Froe who was a who is a um, literary and cultural studies theorist and so great that people used to come into his lectures and sit in the back and listen. And we did Robinson Crusoe. Can you imagine? I mean, Robinson Crusoe, it did seem a little... But um, I wrote... A, you know, we had big essays, quite long essays that we were required to do, and I wrote about the animals in Robinson Crusoe. That was my first piece of animal studies writing. Wonderful. Um, and what I discovered... And one with the sort of um, the key thing that I mentioned in it was um, that Robinson Crusoe was based on a real life story of Alexander Selkirk, who was marooned or forcibly left on an island off the coast of Chile um, for oh, several years, and he had to survive there, and he had goats, and um, he did all sorts of things with goats, apart from breed them, kill them, eat them, whatever. He did all sorts of things with his goats, yes, including those sorts of things. And also he danced with his goats. And that became the sort of point of the, the essay is that, you know, if the story had been written about Alexander Selkirk instead of Robinson Crusoe, you know, accurately, he might have danced with his goats instead of... Robinson Crusoe is is a very uh, traditional attitudes, those sort of pre-enlightenment at- attitudes to um, animals mm. in which they were used. They were, you know, it's very biblical and mm. they're, there f- they're there for his, um, as resources. Mm. Yeah. So, Carol, if you had to name one animal studies scholar who's had a big impact on you, who would it be? Um, someone who was terribly important there weren't many around but Steve Baker um, because I was interested in representations of animals and I and I then wrote my um, my thesis PhD thesis on representations of the thylacine in um, literature uh, scientific literature and from 1809 to 1936 when the last thylacine was, last captive thylacine was um, killed, dead, died. Um, Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Steve. Big shout out to Steve. Yeah, big shout out to Steve. But um, listening to Philip Armstrong's um, podcast on knowing animals, he mentioned... The first thing that he wrote was the post-colonial animal and I remember very distinctly finding that um, on, you know, the Society and Animals oh, wonderful. Journal and, and just feeding on it because this was one of the very few basic things that I could rely on and quote. And oh, um, yeah, wonderful. There had been a conference in America called Representing Animals just before I, s- I started my thesis in 2000 um, and that would have been the first conference mm-hmm. mm. interesting and yeah there's so many really Erica Fudge too because so much of what I write is on history is historical stuff and she's and they, they were three people who were very um, mm. important early mm-hmm. animal well, studies scholars well I've interviewed Erica in this very room oh, Steve's really? not been on the podcast yet though hopefully I'll be able to interview him one day soon so, Carol, what's the most important thing academics can do for animals? Well, I think that that uh, came up in our discussion of um, film. 
Um, I think talk to, I think talk to non-academics. Actually, uh, there's a, there, there was. I read somewhere that if you, when you write an academic article, it's read by maybe a dozen people, and I think probably more in animal studies area. But you know, there are lots of things that you can do where there's a lot of people out there, ordinary people. Um, who are the people who need to need to be made aware of the situation of animals and how to think differently about them and that you can and you know mm. Mm. so um, I, I've written um, catalogue essays um, on uh, an online exhibition, um, you know things like that. Just broadly, knowing animals podcast Your that podcast, any, any podcast. anybody can, <laughs> and and you know all the all the things we've got available. The conversation, which is read by wider audiences, mm, yeah. um, newspaper articles, mm. um, slotting it into li- literary magazines and things like that. And I'm that's one of the things that I'm doing in the background it's got pushed back quite a lot um those are those are the sorts of things that we as academics i think should be trying to do as well as mm-hmm. so Carol? Oh, uh, sorry yeah. i just want to say there that i'm not downgrading all the other things like changing um legislation and all those other things that academics do all the time mm-hmm. So, Carol, if you had the power to change one thing about the human-non-human-animal relationship, what would it be? I think somehow encourage people, a wide range of people, to think of animals differently. And I think that's just the first step because from that first article that I read, it made me look at the, the... the animals that were in our lives in a in a different way and it was hard strangely to try and see it from the animal's point of view Uh, and I'm not going to get into a big discussion about how you can't do that and you can it's very easy and if you're wrong well you know what have you lost just imagining what it's like to sit all day in a room by yourself and not be able to get out and do the things you want to do. I mean, it's not difficult. And yet a lot of dogs are shut up in houses by their owners all day. You know, just look at that animal and imagine what what they might want to do. Um, hmm. So, Carol, what are you working on next? Um, I'm working on a number of things, but as far as animal studies goes, um, I'm converting that um, article on the hunter that we talked about into a presentation for matric students who are doing exactly that. Just by accident, this article is spot on. Um, One of the matric... Tasmanian metric um, so, uh, topics in literature. Wonderful. Literature and film. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, so, and, I, and I saw that as a real opportunity yeah. because right up front I'll be saying, now this I'm coming from animal studies, which they probably haven't even heard of. I mean, they, their teacher hadn't. Um, and, you know, hopefully in questions at the end and, and and it mean what it means it means focusing on the animal in the text um it's you know trying to avoid an anthropocentric view it's not they've looked at eco-criticism it's not eco-criticism which which looks at nature and the animal is sort of embedded in there somewhere um it's it's actually looking at the animal of which we are animals too, and that becomes a whole problematic thing. And you you know that's something you know we've got to think of. So Carol, how can people find out more about your work? Um, 
I have a personal website. Uh, if you if you um, Google Carol Freeman Animal Studies, um, you will find it, uh, and it's got the things that I've written. Um, some of them, yeah, and uh, my uh, UTAS profile, and uh, I also think past bulletins, which are on the um, ASA website, you'll find all of the past bulletins back to the first ones, and I see that as probably the most important thing that I did, because my main aim, when we went to that conference in Perth, I think there were three people three or four people from UTAS who didn't know each other even existed much less were doing work in this in that area until that conference came up and 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 off we went to to Perth um, there were people beginning to work all over Australia after that um, and they t- in in little pockets isolated and it seemed to me that one of the ways to gather everyone together and make them aware of what was going on not just in Australia in the in these different little cities but overseas yeah. um, that uh, something like a bulletin was uh, important to sort of and to put all those conferences all the conferences that were going on in different parts of the world mm-hmm. that no one just didn't well you'd have to get on to this or that mm-hmm to put them all together in one place for people to access. Yeah, and it was a great resource, it still is a great resource, but, you know, particularly when it was uh, timely, it was a great resource for Australian animal studies scholars, but also internationally, so... Uh, yeah, I believe so, yes, and that was the intention. I, You know, I wasn't going to do just a local thing. I wanted to, yeah, the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for all your hard work, Carol, and thank you for coming on Knowing Animals, the podcast where we talk to animal study scholars about their work. And a big thank you to our listeners for tuning in to Knowing Animals. If you enjoy the podcast, why not mention it to someone else? We always love to grow our listeners, have more people learning about animal studies. Now, you can follow us on Twitter at knowing underscore animals or on Facebook at knowing animals. And don't forget that you can also subscribe at iTunes or leave a review at iTunes. Reviews make it easier for people to find us. I'm Siobhan O'Sullivan, and I do like knowing animals.